Dick Kornbluth. I'm doing this PowerPoint, basically a little primer on building science. Although uh, from what the audience appears to be, I'm not sure that I'm not preaching to the converted, but um, I, what I'll do it, I'll go for it and we'll see how it works out. So this is, this session is titled, How Your House Really Works. Basically an introduction to building science. So how do home performance contractors differ from trade contractors such as insulation or heating cooling contractors? Trade contractors focus on installing things and home performance contractors focus on solving problems. What kind of problems do home performance contractors solve? Comfort problems like rooms too hot or too cold, housing is where humidity is a, is a problem in terms of comfort, uh, building durability problems such as moisture problems and ice dams, and health in terms of dealing with sources, not removal so much, but sources of mold, excessive dust and indoor air quality, and last but not least, high energy costs. I, I intentionally put the high energy costs last because home performance contractors um, really focus on these other things as much as they do on, as on saving energy. So how do they do it? They do it by understanding that, that a house is not just a simple heated or cooled box, that it's a complicated system that operates in accordance with the principles of building science. So we're talking to talk about the house as a system. So it's a complicated system. It consists of the building envelope, which is the part of the house that separates the conditioned interior of the house from the outside world. This is where the insulation is. And it includes the mechanical systems in the house, which include the heating plant, water heater, appliances, lights, computers, etc. And it includes the home's occupants. And the envelope, which you can see in this diagram, basically is the boundary between the heated and unheated outside world. And in this case, it could be a garage or it could be a crawl space. This could be a basement or this could be a crawl space, depending on where the thermal boundary, which is the term that we use to uh, describe the envelope and where the envelope is. So when we talk about the mechanical systems, we're talking about furnaces, boilers, water heaters, kitchen fans and bath fans, appliances, lights, computers, apply all appliances basically. And the thing that they all have in common is that they all either use and produce energy. Furnaces and boilers use gas, oil, electricity to produce heat. Fans use electricity to produce kinetic energy. Lights use electricity to produce light. Refriger refrigerators and air conditioners use electricity to run pumps and compressors to remove heat. And finally, the third component of the house system, which is actually really critical, and I probably won't talk about that as much as I should, are the human beings and the pets that live in the house. I once went into a house that had a moisture problem. A woman had a house full of animals. She had four cats and five dogs and you know, tanks full filled with uh, water for her, for her uh, fish collection. And she had incredibly high humidity in the house because the fact is, is that a large dog will exhale as much moisture as a, as a human being in terms, of, um, in terms of breathing. By the way, human beings uh, have been described as, as unvented combustion appliances because we take in a fuel, which is carbon-based. We burn that fuel and we create heat and we create carbon dioxide and we create water vapor. So we're doing exactly the same thing that a furnace does except that we expel those waste products into the environment that we live in. If you put enough human beings in a room, they can produce enough carbon dioxide to cause half the people in the room to start to fall asleep. So we have to keep account of the people who live in the house as a potential source of indoor air quality. So the three parts of the house interact with, the, with each other and with the movement of air, moisture, and heat to create the house system. So it looks like this. We have the envelope, we have the mechanicals, we have the occupants, we have the movement of heat, moisture, and air, and they all interact together and they all affect each other in ways that are mostly predictable and sometimes not so. And some of the ways they interact with each other can actually be harmful to the house and to the people who live in it. And we're gonna talk about that today 
and show how that actually can happen. So now let's talk about the envelope of the house. The first thing you need to know is that insulation by itself may not be sufficient to prevent heat loss. Think about walking outside on a cold winter day in a sweater. If the weather's calm and there's no wind, the sweater will work just fine. But if the wind starts to blow, that sweater actually loses its ability to keep you warm because it's porous and cold air can travel through it and cool your body off. So a sweater basically traps air which makes good insulation, but because it's porous, it lets air through. And if the air is moving, that can cause discomfort. On the other hand, if you go out in a good windbreaking jacket, that windbreaker will stop the movement of air. And in that case, um, that case, the, the uh, windbreaker actually creates comfort. So fiberglass insulation acts a lot like a wool sweater in that it's porous and will let air travel through it, as will cellulose insulation. So if you want to actually create a thermal barrier, an efficient thermal barrier in a building, you not only have to stop the, the heat from traveling through the material by conduction and radiation, you have to stop the air from going through it too. So air sealing is like the windbreaker in that it stops the movement of air through the material. Think about a house. When you think about a house, you have to think about a house like it's a hot air balloon that's anchored to the floor and to the ground. Warm air will rise through any building. And what that warm air does as it rises through the building is it creates a positive pressure at the top of the building. And at the same time as it creates that positive pressure at the top of the building, it creates a negative pressure at the bottom of the building. And so at the top of the building, it's pushing out, and at the bottom of the building, it's sucking in. And if you look at the size of the arrows, they indicate where the pressures are the greatest. So the greatest positive pressure is at the top of the building, and the greatest negative pressure is at the bottom of the building. So if you have leaks at the bottom of the building in the wintertime, as that warm air rises, you're going to cause cold air to enter into the building. And if and if you live in a high radon zone area and your house, of course, is sitting on the ground, that negative pressure can also increase the transfer of radon gas into the building because it's being basically sucked in to the basement by the negative pressure caused by that moving air. So if you want to actually insulate an attic, you have to not only address the insulation problem, you have to address the air leakage problem because at air is going to leak out the top of the building. So where does it leak from? It leaks from all kinds of sources, bathroom vents around bathroom vents or recessed lights, attic hatches, et cetera. So there's leaks out the top, there's leaks in the bottom, basically through the foundation where the foundation and the framing meet. And if you have enough heat leaking out of the house at the top of the building in the winter time, you might get something that looks like this, which are icicles and ice dams. So the question becomes, how do you get icicles and ice dams? Well, people who have insulation in their attic can still get icicles and ice dams. And then the question arises, how does that happen? Well, basically it happens because as heat leaks into the top of the building, it will start to warm up the bottom of the roof deck. What people don't realize is that snow is a very good insulator. Um, you know, igloos are made of snow and the inside of an igloo is relatively warm. So when snow piles up on top of a roof, the surface of that roof deck may not see that 14 degree temperature, but it will see the heat from the house. And as that roof deck warms up, it's going to melt the snow that's in contact with the roof. And that snow will then cause water as it melts to run by gravity to the edge of the roof, where it then freezes and forms icicles. So it's interesting over the years when I've asked people if they have icicles on their roofs, they say, no, it's only at the edge. Um, if you have enough cold, if the weather is cold enough so that the icicles don't melt, as the water freezes, it'll actually build up, physically build up under that pack of snow. And because water, when ice is formed, water expands as ice is, as ice is forming, that forming ice dam can literally push up underneath the shingles and cause water to actually enter into the building. 
and there have been years, you know, fortunately with, in a way, we are kind of a way with uh, climate change, we haven't seen this kind of disaster in the last few years, but I can remember a year in Syracuse where the temperature basically did not reach, we had massive snowfall followed by two weeks of, of freezing temperature where it did not hit zero for two weeks. And the result of that was massive, massive ice dam and water leak problems in houses in Syracuse, literally to the point where insurance companies were renting entire floors of the Hotel Syracuse for task forces to handle the claims. So this is how ice is formed. So how do you stop it? You stop it by sealing all the holes up in the framing of the house at the top of the house where warm air, not heat in the sense of, of conduction and radiation, but actual physical warm air can leak from the building into the attic. So around electrical wires, around the plumbing vent pipe, um, through recessed light fixtures, around ducts, et cetera. So this is a story about Lemoyne College. So I was hired because these brand new buildings that were built for housing at Lemoyne College had the first winter that these buildings were built, they had ice, the icicles that were so severe that were hanging off the front of the buildings that uh, students were actually not physically allowed to enter the buildings from the front and had to go in through the back of the building, which, uh, which was, uh, well, I think it was, basically uh, built on a hill. So it was basically below grade at the back of the building because the danger of the icicles in the front of the building was so severe, they, didn't, they felt it was a, a risk to the students' health. So I was called in to see what was going on. They were brand new buildings. They were making so much ice that they were deemed unsafe. This is a very uh, important tool in our industry. It's called the blower door. It's nothing but a big fan that's mounted in an outside door of a house. The fan can actually suck or blow. It can go both ways, but it's mostly used to uh, suck and pull air out of the house. And so what it does, um, outside air enters the house through air leak sites. And if the outside air is warmer or colder than the inside air, you can visually see the leaks with an infrared camera. So you can use a blower door in the winter time to see cold air entering the building when the house is depressurized and you can use um, in the summertime, you can use a blower door so that you can see warm air entering the building through leaks in the summertime, which is what I did. The, the blower door is actually also a tool that can help quantify the actual air leakage rate of the building, which is very important in our industry uh, for health reasons. So the building was depressurized. I did an infrared scan to find the air leaks. So. Um, so unless there's a big wind, natural air leakage occurs very, very slowly, way too slowly to detect with our senses. And the problem is for the most part in the wintertime, the warm air is leaking away from us. So we're not actually seeing air coming in, we're seeing air going out. So you can't see that from inside the building. But the blower door can create the equivalent of a 20 to 30 mile an hour wind blowing uniformly against all sides of the house. And under those conditions, you can detect the leakage. So here's how a blower door works. Very simple diagram. And here's what I saw. So what you're seeing is a, a digital image and an image without the blower door running of the same, the same thing. You can barely see the outline of the light here and here. When the blower door was running, this is what I saw. I am now looking at warm air leaking into those walls from the attic. So here is here, and here is here, and here is basically above the, above the light. Here's another scene. This is, I'm looking at exactly the same thing. This boundary is the edge of this closet. So when the blower door was turned on, this is what I saw. Here's the door. Here's the door and here's a leak into that wall cavity from the attic, which is caused by the negative pressure that the blower door creates in that room, pulling that warm air from the attic down into the room. A third, a third view, we have a window, we have a corner. This is the digital image. Turn on the blower door and every one of those walls was leaking air into the, build, into the, into the wall cavities under the blower door pressure.
It's not just about ice dams. If you've ever um, seen mold growing on the underside of a roof deck, 90% um, or 99% of the time, it's not because of a roof leak. 99% of the time, it's a combination of two factors. You have to have a really, really good fuel and that fuel turns out to be uh, plywood or even better, OSB board. And in addition to that, you need to have a source of moisture because mold likes moisture. And so if you have air leaks into an attic in the wintertime, that moisture ends up condensing on the underside surface of the roof deck. That creates a really good environment for mold to grow. And the mold will then grow black mold on the surface of that roof, the underside surface of that roof. What's most important to know about this is that as far as I know, and I've talked to a few people about this who know, the specific mold that grows on plywood is actually not harmful to human beings, although it is exceedingly potentially harmful to the roof itself. And it's the major cause of rotted roofs and, and roof rot over time. So not only does air leakage create a problem in terms of um, heat getting to the roof, it, it creates a problem in terms of moisture getting to the roof and that moisture can create mold. So the mold connection. So what does mold need? It needs spores, it needs a fuel, so it could be dust, it could be seat rock paper, it could be plywood or particle board, and it needs moisture. So air leaks have consequences. The blue is moisture, the red is heat, and the orange is heat flow due to air leaks. So the fact that you have insulation may stop heat transfer by convection, I mean by uh, conduction and by radiation, but those holes in the top of your building are going to let warm air get to the attic, and they're going to let moisture transport get to the attic. Finding leaks, sometimes it's easy and usually it's not. I'm going to go quickly through these slides. There's all kinds of framing details. What's most important to know that the, the leaks that are most consequential for heat loss to the attic are leaks in holes that you cannot see because they are hidden in the framing of your building. They are not, you, you, you can walk around your house, inside your house and look up at your ceilings and you're thinking to yourself, there's no, I don't see any holes. I don't see any holes in my ceiling, but basically they are at the tops of partition walls and pipe chases, electrical penetrations, et cetera. So um, examples around built-in furniture and closets, recessed lights, drop ceilings are a huge source of leaks, um, usually found in kitchens and occasionally baths, electrical outlets, and as you saw this picture earlier, the plumbing vent pipe, which is every electrician's friend because it's a great way to get wires um, from the basement up to an attic to the second floor, but it's also a giant source. It's basically a giant highway for heat transfer. So here's a flu chase. What you need to notice about this is the color of the fiberglass insulation that's around that flu chase. The dark color that you see in this fiberglass insulation is due to the fact that that fiberglass has been filtering moving air moving through that chase and has been trapping dirt and dust in the fiberglass as that air has, has moved. So the, I've pulled it away to show, to show the, the gap around the duct, but basically one of the diagnostic tools that insulators can use in attics to find air leak sites is to look for dirty fiberglass. The classic one, as I mentioned, is the plumbing chase such as this. Um, this was an interesting house because it was a balloon framed house that was under construction. And so all the sheetrock and plaster had been removed so you can actually see the construction details. So what's interesting is here's a plumbing chase and you can look and see that there's a gap that they basically cut the framing to allow the plumbing chase to, to travel through the building. So this is now the attic and this is living space. The other thing that's interesting is that you can have pipes going through horizontally through a whole series of studs and then entering into that plumbing chase. And, and that plumbing chase will not only collect the air that's in this chase, it can collect the air that's in all of these stud cavities also where they're connected into the plumbing chase. So, you know, very quickly, uh, soffit bypasses. Here's, here's an actual soffit bypass. What you see here where the arrow is, is the studs. And the space between the studs is an open stud cavity on top of the soffit. So warm air 
from the living space below will heat the air inside that stud cavity, which will then enter right into the attic space. So interior partition walls are a problem. There are openings that have to be sealed for electrical uh, wiring and even the actual partition wall itself. In older houses, there might be no plate at the top. In newer houses, there might be a plate, but there could be a gap between the plate and the sheetrock, which I'll show you in a minute. This was a house that had massive ice dams, brand new high-end house in suburban Syracuse. Partition wall leakage caused ice dams to the point where the, the ice had backed up into this back room, which was kind of an addition sunroom and had seriously damaged the sheetrock ceiling. So we were called in to find the problem. We did a blower door test, we found air leakage. And what the biggest single biggest source of the air leakage was, was this is a partition wall. And this is a, this black line is the sheetrock. And at the top of the sheetrock, there is an actual physical gap that you can see right here with between the sheetrock and the um, top plate of that wall. I did, um, I ended up um, doing a floor plan of the entire second floor of that building. And I count, calculated the linear feet of partition walls and outside walls in the second floor of that building. And I assumed an eighth inch gap on one side and a 16th inch gap on the other. And when I added it all together, I had a 16 inch square hole. So that, that base building was actually leaking through a 16 inch square hole that was distributed among a couple of hundred feet of partition wall. So back then we were not foaming, we were caulking and we sealed all that stuff up with caulk. So getting back to the house system, we have the interaction between the mechanical system and the envelope to look at. So not all interactions are good. You can insulate a house and cause a kitchen exhaust fan to backdraft a furnace, boiler, or water heater, potentially generating dangerous carbon monoxide. Well, how does that happen? So imagine that you have uh, a tight house. You turn on a fan, let's say a bathroom fan. Let's say you have a kitchen fan and a dryer in the basement. That creates a negative pressure because you're sucking air out of the house. What might happen then is that you have a problem. And the problem is, is that nature doesn't like a vacuum. It wants to solve that problem of a vacuum. So it looks for a hole to bring in makeup air to neutralize that negative pressure that you created with all those fans. And if the house is tight enough, if you have an atmospheric furnace boiler, water heater, or fireplace, the easiest place to get that makeup air is gonna be the flue. So you can theoretically turn on a kitchen fan or a bathroom fan. If you have enough fans running and you have a tight enough house, you will backdraft your furnace, water boiler, water heater, or fireplace. And there's a sad story of an extreme case of this in central New York, where a guy turned on his whole house fan, the one in the that people put in the ceiling, the whole house fan that gets put into the ceiling, it's sort of poor man's air conditioning. And it had turned out to be a very a warm day and it cooled off at night. And he didn't open enough windows for makeup air when he went to bed. So when he went to bed, the house cooled off, the fan was running, the furnace came on, it backdrafted and he died in his sleep of monoxide poisoning. This happened about 20 years ago. Now, flue gases contain water vapor and sometimes carbon monoxide. So how much water is made? Let's talk about the water. For every 100,000 BTUs of natural gas that are burned, a full gallon of water is created. So if you have a 100,000 BTU furnace in your house or boiler, every hour that that runs, there's a whole gallon of water that is created by that combustion that has to be removed from the building. And it's normally removed by going up the chimney. But if that water doesn't go up the chimney, it's going to go and stay in the house. Um, so let's talk about what happens when things go wrong with a heating system. So if you have a furnace, like an atmospheric furnace or any furnace, essentially the blower is gonna do two things. It's gonna push supply air, heated supply air into the living space, and it's gonna return supply or return air to the furnace. But if you have a leak in that return system, 
because nature doesn't uh, basically like uh, you know a vacuum and it's going to it's going to look for a zero sum game here it's going to balance out the supply and return if you happen to have a return leak in the basement of the house where the furnace sits it's going to bring that return air in from the basement to, to balance out the two units of supply air and what that's going to do is that's going to basically pressurize the living space because you have an excess of supply over return and it's gonna create negative pressure in the basement. By the way, that will cause uh, air leakage to increase. You'll have negative pressure in the basement. And if the basement is tight enough, it will cause the backdrafting problem and the chimney will backdraft and pull uh, flue gases back into the living space. So I'm gonna end with, a, with I think one of the best illustrations of the relationship of mechanical systems and the envelope. This is a true story of a customer of mine. She called us for an attic insulation estimate. She lived in a small, tiny house, ranch house on a slab. When I went to the house, I noticed there was mold growing along the edge of the ceiling of a rear addition. I asked her, I said, when did that mold problem start? start? And she said that the mold problem started after her furnace was replaced. So that was curious. I wonder, how did she get mold on her ceiling in her addition after her furnace was replaced. Well, this is the outline of her house. She had a basically simple little house. There was a bedroom, there was a bathroom, there was a common area and a kitchen here, and a utility room in the middle of the house with a furnace and a water heater and a washer and a dryer. And there was the addition, which is this space on the back of the house. So what happened was, well, I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna show you the mold in a minute. But she asked, uh, this is an interesting story because when she saw the mold forming on the, the ceiling of her addition, she called a roofer who told her that she needed a new roof. Then she called Sears who sent the siding salesman out who told her that she needed to reside her house. Um, good thing that she didn't bite on either of those because she called us in. And I went into the house and I looked carefully um, at the details in her, um, utility room. Now, because her house was so small, the she did not have a ducted return. What she had was a grill on the back of the furnace that was a common return facing into a hallway. So what happened was when her furnace got replaced, they never connected the furnace to that grill. And that put the furnace return inside the utility room. So when the furnace came on and the door was closed to the utility room, the return air was coming from the utility room, which created the same negative pressure that I showed you before, which was causing basically the water heater and the furnace to backdraft. And what did that result in? Well, here's her ceiling. Along the edge of the ceiling in that addition, there was mold growing along the edge of the ceiling. So how did that mold grow? Well, the mold grew because the relative humidity in her house was drastically increased by the, the backdrafting of the furnace, which caused moisture levels to increase, which caused the water to condense on the ceiling where it was colder than other parts of the ceiling. And of course, near the edge, there was no insulation in her addition because she had a crappy job of insulating done by a contractor. And so the surface of that sheetrock got wet from the condensing water and the mold grew along the edge of the ceiling. So the bottom line was, was that the damage to her building envelope was directly related to a flaw in her heating system design that shows the connection between the mechanical systems of the building and the envelope of the building. And so um, I'm gonna end here because this is the kind of issue that a home performance contractor would figure out and address that a heating contractor would never address and an insulation contractor would never understand, which is why you need to actually call a home performance contractor to solve the problems in your building. Just for everybody's sake, one more time. Okay, that's it. <laughs>